Hey, what's up? My name is Kevin Moore, and I'm the lead pastor right here at the church. And thank you so much for joining us right here at watchthechurch.com. This is our online gathering. In fact, watchthechurch.com, we gather every hour on the hour so that you and your friends, whenever you need it, you can jump online and get an inspirational message out of God's Word. Now, before we start this week's service, I I just want to let you know something that's happening at our local live gathering that you might want to know about. We right now at the church, we we gather at Visalia, California. It's 120 South Locust Street, located right downtown. And currently, we gather at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. But starting Sunday, September the 16th, we are actually adding a third gathering that's going to start at 1 p.m. So starting Sunday, September the 16th, we're going to have a 9 a.m. service, an 11 a.m. service, and a 1 p.m. service that gathers right here at 120 South Locust Street, downtown Visalia. So if you live anywhere in Tulare County, I want to invite you to join us at 9, 11, or 1, starting September the 16th. So hey, thanks so much for joining us at watchthechurch.com, and I really pray that you enjoy this week's message. There's an interesting story in the scriptures. Um, It's the story of the children of Israel. And um, it's really interesting in the Bible because when you read when you read the Bible, scripture says about itself that the Bible is is alive. It's it's breathing. It it it, it works and cuts deep into our heart. And I always say about scriptures that whenever we whenever we look at the stories of the Bible, if we look deep enough and we look close enough, we can actually see. Uh, images um, of ourselves and we can find ourselves in the story we can find ourselves in the characters at time and there's a really interesting story in the Bible about the children of Israel that that goes for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years it's actually only you know kind of chronicled within a few chapters and a few books but it spans hundreds of years and hundreds of thousands of individuals lives and we pick up the story about around 400 years after the children of Israel have been in slavery in Egypt. And they've been, they've been slaves, and that's something that we in our generation today, as individuals in this room anyway, we don't know what, what that is like to, to be a slave, to work for no f- money, to, to work and to be beaten, to be persecuted, and just put back into forced labor. And they were doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years, and God through um, um, miracles, literally, he delivers them out of this slavery and he is going to take them to what he calls a promised land. And so these people, you've got to put yourself mentally where they are. They, they, they've been and their family has been in generations upon generations upon generations upon generations of slavery. And now they are free and they are out in the desert with their leader, Moses, and they are on pursuit. They are purposely pursuing this thing called the promised land it was their goal and whether they get there in five days five years they didn't know but we have one goal and we are looking for the promised land god take us to the promised land and one year goes by two years go by five years go by eight years go by ten years go by and they're still walking around the desert 12 years go by, they're still walking around the desert. 15 years go by, 20 years go by, 30 years go by, 30 some years go by, and they still find themselves walking around the desert trying to find this magical place called the promised land. They're they're, they're trying to cross the line and get to this place that's promised, this, this place of hope, this place that scripture says was flowing with milk and honey. It's, it's a great lush land. And they've been walking aimlessly for more than 30 years now. And they still haven't found it. Now, as I read the, the, this story and as I look at this story, I, I really 
I actually, I start to think about the series that we're in called Core. The, to getting, getting to the center of, of, of what we actually need most. And we've been talking about that there's, there's needs that we have. Not, not wants, not desires. I, I want a car. I want to eat at Taco Bell. I don't know why you'd want to eat at Taco Bell, but I want to eat at Taco Bell. I, 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 I want this over here. But deeper than that, core needs and needs of security, needs of identity, needs of belonging, um, needs of competency, and, and needs... There's a deep-seated need in each and every one of us of, of a purpose. Why in the world am I here? And it's this magical promised land that we all, when we start to get of age and we start to become self-aware, we start to think these thoughts of why, who am I, who can I trust, what am I good at, and then the big question comes, why am I here? What's, what's the purpose for all of this? And we start to wrestle with the purpose of life. And we want inside of us, we want this, this promised land inside of us of, of purpose. This, this feeling, this emotion of, I'm important. I'm valuable. There, there, there's something that I offer and something that I give this world that's so important that that's why I'm here. And what happens if we're not really careful in our life, what can very easily happen is, is we can begin to be just like the children of Israel in the desert. That there's this promised land that we're looking for, and then I, I, why am I here? And we start to pursue our purpose in life in junior high school and pursue our purpose in life in high school then we go to college and then we get married and then maybe that doesn't work out we get married again and then then we get into this over here then we go back to school and before you know it one year's gone by 10 years gone by 30 years have gone by 40 some years have possibly gone by and you're still walking around saying why am i here what's what's my purpose in life I don't feel like I'm doing anything of any sort of value. And what I want to talk about today, because I know from my own life experience, but also in being a pastor, senior pastor now from five years and working with students and families for more than 20 years, is I, I know the weight of this and I also know the depravity that can come in someone's heart when they wrestle not just for months or weeks but possibly for years of why am I here and so today what I want to do is is I want to talk to you about what are the things that cause you and me anytime I say you today just know I'm not when every time I point a finger at you there's there's three coming back at me so every time I say you I'm also talking about I'm talking about us but what is it that what is it that causes you to walk around the desert of your life trying to cross that magical line of purpose? What, what, what keeps you from that? Because here's the thing, you, you've, got, you've, you've got to get this fixed. Because you do have a purpose in life. There is a reason why you're here. But if you don't know what that is, then you can't even help anybody else, let alone yourself. So what is it that keeps us from our purpose? Here, here, here's just a few. There's many. But today, because of time, we're just going to sit on maybe two or three. So here, here's the first one. Is one of the things that keeps us in the desert place in our heart to where we're wondering why we're here is, first of all, is we're always looking for the next big thing. We're always looking for the next big thing. The thing that's really big. The thing that's really important. The thing that's really earth shattering the thing that's really going to really get me busy in life or really going to move me ahead or someone's really going to notice so i'll get more than 15 likes on my instagram account i mean this thing's going to really go big and what happens is is we we start to look for the next big thing and this starts whenever we're little doesn't it when you're in elementary school when you are in preschool you can't wait to go to kindergarten then you go to kindergarten and you see the second graders i can't wait to be in second grade then you get in the second grade. I can't wait to be in the fifth grade. I can't wait to be in junior high. I can't wait to play on the baseball team. I can't wait to be a freshman. Then you're a freshman you're like, my God, this is horrible. I can't wait to be a sophomore. And then you go through the sophomore slump. I can't wait to get my driver's license. I can't wait to get my first real girlfriend. I mean, I can't wait for that. I can't wait to graduate. I can't wait to go to college. I can't wait to graduate college. 
And our whole life, I can't wait to get married. Our whole life, we are, we are wired. We are duped into thinking that life will get better when I'm in elementary school. Life will get better whenever I'm in junior high. Life will get better whenever I get my car. Life will get better. I'll cross the line of purpose, and I'll find out who I am when I finally get that. And we are wired in our life to always be looking for the next big thing. And when you look for the next big thing, you are missing. You're going to miss the purpose of your life. Because this thing inside of you, it, it, it's not going to be found in the big thing. It's actually going to be found in the small. You see, the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. And if whoever's going to gain his life must lose it. And whoever's going to be a leader must first be a servant. And whoever wants to experience the big thing in their life has to begin to master the small things. Because it is when we master the small things that we actually begin to get the big. And we see this all throughout history. We see this all throughout Scripture. Here's just one. Jesus said this, Luke 16, 10. He said, whoever can be trusted with a little can also be trusted with much. However, whoever is dishonest with very little is also dishonest with much. Jesus says, listen, if you can't take care of five bucks, you're not going to be able to take care of 5,000. And if you, can't take, if you can't manage one hour, you're not going to be able to manage your life. If, if you can't take care of this one thing, you're not going to be able to take care of many things. We have to begin to find the big and the small. There's a story that I love. It's a story of King David. And King David was around 17 years old. That's somewhat debatable, but he was around 17 years old when he gets anointed the next king of his, of his country. Now, there's already a king still there. Saul's still on the throne, but David is anointed as the next one. So David, at 17 years old, has a big thing that he's looking forward to. I mean, we're not talking about, I got a date on Friday. We're talking about, I got a coronation coming. I mean, I'm going to be the king. Taxes are mine. I mean, if it, I'm loaded. I'm living in the castle. I'm the king. He has a big thing on the horizon. And you know what he does right after he gets anointed by the prophet Samuel as the next king of Israel? He goes back out into his father, his, not even his field. He goes into his father's sheep field, and he becomes a shepherd over his father's sheep. The big thing's coming, but today, i got to take care of these sheep. And as he's taking care of the sheep, one day, again, mind you, they're not his sheep. They're his daddy's sheep. He sees a bear, and David risks his life for his father's sheep and he rescues and he kills the bear so that his father's sheep could be safe. And he stays in the field and then a the lion comes. And he again, he risks his own life for his father's sheep and he defeats the lion. And then he gets a note from his dad saying, come up to the house. So he comes up to the house and his dad says, all of your brothers are going off to war. Now remember, David is the next king. Where should kings go? Kings should go fight. But his dad says, David, they're going off to war, but here's what I need you to do. Go back and watch my sheep for me. And David goes back and he watches his father's sheep while his brothers go off to be war heroes. They're doing the big thing for their nation. And David's just watching sheep for his dad. One day his dad comes to him and says, David, I got a task for you. I want you to take some cheese. I want you to take some cheese to the front lines of the war, and I want you to see what's going on up there, and then you come back home and you give me a report. And David, being an obedient son, says, yes, Father, I will, but be this, is, this is so amazing. But before I go, let me go take care of something. And David goes and he finds someone, an assistant, to take care of his father's sheep while he is gone. And while he's going to do the big thing, he doesn't forget about the small thing, and he takes care of his father's sheep, making sure there's a faithful shepherd. And then David goes off to deliver the cheese. And as he goes there, that's when he hears Goliath, and now you know the rest of the story. And things start to happen very quickly with David. But what I want you to notice there, David ends up in the story of his life. Actually, it's about 25-year journey, okay, from 17 to the time he becomes king. It's around 25, 30 years. But David goes from the small thing, I'm a shepherd, to the big thing. But the way that he gets there 
is small thing, small thing, small thing, small thing. How did God know that David would be a good king over his people because David was a good shepherd over his father's sheep? How did God know that David would protect his nation because David protected his father's sheep from a lion, from a bear, and from Goliath? How did God know that David would be a good steward and take care of finances and take care of his kingdom and take care of all of the things that he needed to take care of was because David took care of his father's sheep and before he went to the big thing, he made sure there was someone to take care of him. David mastered the small. And because he mastered the small, he found his purpose in life and became not only the king of Israel, but he became the predecessor of Jesus Christ himself because Jesus is of the lineage of the house of David. You see, and many times what happens in your life and many times what happens in my life is we want to feel like we're important. We want to feel like we belong. We want to feel like we're making an impact and we're looking for the big thing and we're missing the small thing that's right in front of our hands. If you want to cross the line and get purpose right here, you won't find it in the big. You're going to find it in a sequence of small, small, small. And until we humble ourselves and be faithful with the tiny, little, minuscule thing that God's given us to do today, we will never have the sense of purpose and huge desire in our heart that we want tomorrow. So the first thing that keeps us in the desert is we just keep looking for the next big thing. Here, here's another one, is we, we, we quit way too soon. We just, we, we quit way too soon. Now here's the thing, I'm not going to say that there are times in your life that you shouldn't quit. Okay, do you, I, I remember that old, that old statement that, that, that winners never quit, you remember that? Okay, that is totally not true. Okay, winners quit all the time. Okay, Larry Bird was in the NBA because he quit sleeping in. Because he quit being lazy. Tom Brady is still playing when he's in 41 years old because he quit eating food he shouldn't eat. He quit going out on the weekends. Winners quit all the time. But winners quit things that are keeping them from their purpose. And people who lose, people who don't find their purpose, they quit doing the things that are going to take them to their purpose. And what happens many times is, is we quit too soon. And we miss crossing the line and finding maybe even that small thing that brings massive results right here. And we quit too soon. There's a guy, he's, he's well written about, his name was R.U. Darby. R.U. Darby. Now, R.U. Darby, years and years ago, it was around the gold rush time, and R.U. Darby, he, he, he bought this piece of property, and he also he bought some mining equipment, and he started to mine for gold in his property. He bought all, he went into the debt, and he bought all this equipment, he bought the property because he thought there's gold there, he did some testing, and there was gold, and so he starts to mine, and he gets all the equipment, and the big, huge equipment, and he's mining for gold, and they get some, and he's mining for gold, and they get some, and man, ka-ching, money cometh. I mean, it is good. And then all of a sudden, dirt, dirt, rocks, rocks. For one month, no gold. Two months, no gold. Three months, no gold. He is hitting nothing but dirt, mud, and useless stones. So are you Darby after months of this? He talks to his dad who had financed the whole thing and says, I'm out. There's a junk dealer down the street. This, this land is junk. This, this property is junk. This, the, the, this stuff that we got, it's a lot of money, but it's useless because there's no more gold here. We've been mining for months. Let's sell this stuff to the junk dealer. So the junk dealer, knowing nothing about gold, and just wants the equipment and says, sure, I'll buy the equipment, and sure, I'll buy the property. It might be a good investment. And so the junk dealer goes, and he gets the property, and he gets the equipment, and he starts to mine. And the very first day, in fact, within minutes of right where Darby stopped, the junk dealer hits gold. In fact, he hits one of the largest gold mines in the history of the United States. And it was one, two, three feet. 
from where R.U. Darby's equipment stopped. Three feet, man. Okay, three feet. Now here's the big question. Are you Darby? See what I did there? Boom, boom, get that? Here's the big question. It is, is are you Darby? Are you mining for gold? Man, there, there's, there's gold that you want right here. You want to make an impact in your kids. You want to make an impact in the business world. You want to, you understand, like we talked about last week, that the main purpose of your life is not to accrue things, but the main purpose of your life is to take the things that you have, that you are good at doing, and do them in such a way that the people around you will understand that they can trust God because God wants them so badly that through the death and resurrection of his son Jesus, he's invited them to be their, his children. We, we know that that's the big purpose, and man, that's what you want. Maybe you, you want to make an impact. But the question is, is are you Darby? And have you, have you made it a habit in your life to quit? To quit too soon. What, what, why do we quit too soon? First one we quit is, it's a good example of this, is my, my, my grandson Elliot. Elliot's about a year and a half, well, he'll, he'll, he'll be two in January, so you guys do the math. Is a year and a half, two years old, and Elliot comes over to the house, and when Elliot comes over to the house, this is what he does. He goes and he sees Mamma, and he goes, hold you, hold you, and he wants Mamma to hold him. Then after a while, he's ready to play, and he gets down, and he's done with Grandma now, and so he gets down, and he sees a ball, and he'll walk, and he'll say ball. And then he'll see my computer, and he'll come to my computer and say ball or dunk, because we watch YouTube videos of Sean Kemp and Shaquille O'Neal dunking and things. So, so he'll play with the ball, then he'll come to me and say ball. Then he'll sit, see outside, and he'll go, tie, tie, so he wants to go outside. Then he goes outside, and he hears an airplane, airplane, mermaid, mermaid, and he starts to look at airplanes. And then he goes over, pool, pool, he wants to swim. And then he goes back inside and he says, book, ball. And when you, within 20 minutes of Elliot being at her house, the whole place is just strewn <laughs> with toys and blankets and wires and DVDs and books. And it's, there's stuff everywhere. There's half played with toys in our entire living room and outside. Within minutes of Elliot being there. You see, Elliot has a habit of doing something, the very thing that's going to keep you and I from fulfilling the purposes in our life, is Elliot is constantly finding another opportunity. He just finds another opportunity. He's got a chance to have a quality time with his mamma, but he sees a ball. Then he's got a chance to really enjoy that ball, but then he sees a computer. Then he's got a chance to have some really quality time with Grandpa because Grandpa's the best. Papa's amazing. So he wants to sit down with Papa, and then he sees outside. Then he sees the bird, and then he sees the airplane, and then he sees the pool. And Elliot has a habit of not following through with the things he puts his hands to. And because of that, he doesn't get the fulfillment of all of that. Now, Elliot's just a baby. But here's the thing, many times we at 42 and 37 and 26 years old, we act just the same. Because all of a sudden we start something and we're all in, ah, got a chance to work second shift. So I'm going to quit doing that because I got to you know, okay, work second shift. Okay, then, okay, well, the kids are in sports and, okay, well, here's an opportunity. I can play in a sports league myself and then, okay, I need to lose some weight and start going to the gym and then, okay, well, but this over here and then that over here and we're just going, brum, 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 brum. And when you look back over the course of the last two years of our life, we see everything from half-finished projects, half-finished relationships, half-finished commitments. And in our heart, we're wondering, why am I here? You may have found it with that thing that you dropped. You may have found the purpose and the reason for getting up in the morning, but you, you, you let it go too soon for this other thing over here, and then another thing. And many times we wander around the dead, and our life feels like a dry, deserted place, and our heart feels empty and dry, lack of purpose, because we just quit too soon because we find another opportunity. And another one, another reason why we quit is inconvenience. It's not a good time. I'm, uh, uh, it's not a good season. My kids are in sports. There's my marriage. Uh, my, my, my grandma's sick. Money's tied. It's really hard. And it's inconvenient. And so we start something and then we stop because it's no longer easy. 
Another one is lack of results, like are you Darby? It's been, I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm tr- it just ain't working, I'm out. And one of the reasons why we take another lap in the desert of our heart when it comes to pursuing purpose is because we just have a habit of quitting too soon. If we would just keep going, you'd never know what the next three feet brings. Now, here's the, here's the last one. And it's a feeling of inadequacy. One of the reasons why we, we don't do things or we don't find the things that are going to find purpose in our heart that give us this reason for waking up in the morning, that we know there's a bigger thing to my life than just this. One of the reasons why we don't find that or sometimes even we stop even pursuing things is because we feel like we're inadequate. We, we feel like we're inadequate. Now we're going to pick back up where we left off with the children of Israel. 37 years go by, 38th year, 39th year, now it's 40 years. 40 years in the desert. And they finally come to the line. And they can see right there over the Jordan River. Aha! It's the promised land. And they're a little bit scared because we, we, we made it. Okay, this is it. 40 years manna from heaven and, fi- and cloud, of, cloud during the day and fire by night. We're finally here. I made it. I can see it. I can see it, man. And they're all excited. And so Moses picks 12 spies to go into the land because the land was inhabited. There, was, there were people there. There were cities there. There were farms there. And so Moses sends 12 spies to go look at the land and see, okay, we're here now, but before we just charge in, let's be good stewards here and let's, let's take a look at what we got. So he sends 12 spies and the 12 spies go in and they see, they come back and they say, man, there, there, there's grapes there that people are having to carry on poles. I mean, there's huge grapes, and there's this type of food, and there's water everywhere, and there's lush green grass, and they're they're, they're explaining this, describing this utopia. It's what they've always wanted, and they're just a few feet away. And so all of the spies come back and say, it's amazing. It's amazing. So Moses and the folks say, well, Well, let's get on up out of here. Let's go. And all of a sudden, 10 of the 12 spies say, ho, 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 ho. Let's think about this a little bit. Now, two of the spies say, let's go. We can take the land. But 10 of them say this. Verse number 31 of Numbers 13, it says, But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land in which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw are men of great stature. There's giants there. There's hard days ahead of us. And there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, who came from giants. Now listen to the words. And we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. We were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And then they say, and we also were grasshoppers in theirs. When these men saw what was in front of them, their first thought was, I'm not good enough. I am like a grasshopper in my own eyes. When I look in the mirror, I see a piddly nothing. Now, because that's how I see myself, I know that's how they see me too. Now, here's the thing. How do they know how they saw them? They didn't even see them. They were spying. It made no sense. And here's the thing. When you are been looking and when you come to that point to where you got a chance to go in and do something you've never done or do something maybe you've always wanted to do, what happens is is there's a tendency in us to think, I'm inadequate. I can't take the land. I'm inadequate. I can't teach that class. 
I'm inadequate. I can't serve there. I'm inadequate. I can't, I, I, I can't do that. I can't go there. I can't be that because I'm not, I'm not adequate. And so you know what the children of Israel did? Unfortunately, they, they listened to the other spies. Let's take another lap. And you see, in our life, when we have the opportunity to step into something that's small, it's behind the scenes, or maybe it's, it's a step that we've, we're stepping out in faith, no matter what it might be, is one of the first things we say to ourselves is, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for this. It, it, it came too quick. I'm, I'm, I'm not financially ready for this move. I'm, I'm not, this is not a good time. I need to get a few things fixed in here before I step out and do this thing I, because, I'm, because I'm not ready. Another thing we say is, is I'm not good enough. I, I'm just not good enough, man. I'm not, I'm, I'm not good enough to lead. I'm not good enough to serve. I'm not, I'm not good enough to be a part. I'm not, I'm not good enough to do that. I, I don't have any experience. I'm, I'm inadequate. I'm not ready. I'm not good enough. And to that, my response is this. Join the club, man. I mean, I mean, for real. Join the club on feeling inadequate. Join the club on not being ready. Join the club. Here's what I've found in my personal life, as well as books, you know, studying and, 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 and the scriptures as well, is that if you and I wait until we're ready, we will die waiting. It's never a good time financially. It's never a good time in your family. It's never going to be the right, perfect time. And if you wait until you're ready, you're going to die in the desert, and you're never going to find the purpose inside of your heart that you're longing for. You're always going to feel inadequate. Always. If you don't, you're a narcissist. You're off in the melon anyway, okay? Okay. Which by definition makes you inadequate. You just don't even think you are. So you are always going to be inadequate. Always. In everything you're doing. And I've found in my life, it's in those times when I feel like I'm not ready. And it feels like those times that I feel like I am inadequate. When I lean in on what God's called me to do with my family. Or what God's called me to do in my life. Or what God's called me to do in my finance. Or what God's called me to do. And I step out anyway. In spite of the feeling of inadequacy. I, something happens in my heart. Listen, I'll, I'll just let you in on a little bit. I, I always feel inadequate. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. I don't mean to be gross, but I got to go to the bathroom and take a little pee pee every time, right before I come up on stage. Why? Because I'm scared to death. Every Sunday, I think to myself, have I studied enough? This is God's word for crying out loud. I'm standing on the stage and I'm telling these group of people in two services, three, as well as online, listen to me because I've heard from God. What? If that doesn't scare me, something's wrong here, Right? I, I always feel inadequate. Every Sunday I feel inadequate. We're, 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 getting ready to start a, we're getting ready to start a school of ministry at the church. We have six local students and one from Texas. I never went to four-year college. And I'm starting a Bible school. And I never went to four-year school. I have a two-year degree in drafting. And then I did home course studies for two years to, to, to train myself in, in uh, scripture. But I know in my heart there's this promised land. There's something that God is asking me and our organization to do. And that's to raise up people to be pastors and leaders for the kingdom of God. And I feel totally inadequate. But I'm going to do it. Why? Because he asked me to. That's why. Why? I'm not doing it because I feel smart. I don't feel smart. I'm not doing it because I feel ready. I don't feel ready. 
I'm doing it because I know it's something that God, the creator of the universe, has asked me to do. So in spite of my inadequacies, it, 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 see what I was talking about? I can't even speak. In spite of my inadequacies or feelings thereof, I'm just simply going to obey. And I have found in my life that it's in those moments of breaking past the feelings and just simply obeying even in the smallest of things that's when all of a sudden I look up and I've crossed the Jordan and I have this core need met in my life. I've got a purpose. And every day I wake up, there's a purpose to glorify God. There's a purpose to serve and love my wife. There's a purpose to provide and protect and propel my children forward. There's a purpose to study God's word and be a, a good workman in it so I can provide God's word for people that follow us at the church. There's purpose here. Do I feel adequate? No. Am I ready? No. But I'm here. And what I want to encourage you is this, is you are not going to find what you're looking for in the big thing. You're going to find it in the small. And you will find what you were looking for when you persevere through inconvenience. And you focus in and you finish the task. Even if it's menial and even if it's inconvenient, you'll find it when you finish and finish strong. And you can only do it when you push past the emotional feelings of inadequacy and emotional feelings of lack. So today... Where, where are you on this as the band comes up? Where are you on this, on this thing of purpose? Purpose. What is your purpose? Now we know the purpose of our life is to do what God has placed in our hands to such the extent that others will know that there is a God and he's invited them to be his child. We know that's the purpose. But how do you get there? How do you get there right here? You get there by doing the small things over and over and over. Put your heart what God has placed in your hands. You get there by doing that again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And then again. And you get there by pushing past the feelings of, feelings of inadequacy. Feelings of I'm not quite ready. And just rolling up your sleeves and saying, God, I don't know why you picked me for this, but I'm in. And when you do that, you're on your way to that thing you need most, a core desire. You're on your way to purpose. Purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you, God, that you are good and that you love us, that you care for us. Thank you, God, that we, as we've been talking about the past several weeks, we, we can trust you. We can trust you. Because you, you are the one who wants us. So you sent Jesus to die on the cross and raise from the dead to invite us to be your child. And now, even just through the, just through the gospel alone, we we can be secure because we know we can trust you. We have found our identity. I'm now a child of God. And we know that we belong because God, the creator of the universe, actually wants us. And God also help us to find our purpose. By taking these small things, these many, this little menial things of our life. And just doing them in such a way. That it not only brings you glory, but it also gives us one of the deepest core needs of our life. It gives us the feeling of purpose. So God, I, I don't know what everyone in this room is called to do with their life in this season. But I do know, God, that whatever it is, they will find it in the small things. That whatever it is, they will find it by persevering. That whatever it is, they will find it when they push past their emotional feelings of inadequacy and they 
you just simply obey. So God, place this in each of our hearts, stir it up, shake it inside of us, so that we'll start to apply it in, in, in whatever area and lane of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Holy Spirit, do your work. Amen.